Now we're really getting in on over our heads here. This chapter 9 is, is pretty deep stuff. It's preceded by the fact, see, the Lord in the narratology tells us that he's been doing all the destroying that's been going on here. But first of all, why is this uh, the theme of the Book of Mormon is, what would you say? The theme of the Book of Mormon is, of course, salvation in Jesus Christ and so forth. But what's its historical message? <coughs> what's its particular message to us? It was given, as, is it called a voice of warning, remember? Polly P. Pratt wrote the, the voice of warning, the Book of Mormon. What's it warning us against? Oh, hey, wait, wait, let's try out our sh shiny new role. Brother Wolf, what's it warning us against? Brother Wolf? Yes. What's the Book of Mormon warning us against? Well, what's, what's the outcome we're going to try to avoid? What will happen if things go on? What's it warning us against? Well, that is the real calamity, you see. But what's the immediate calamity that things are being warned against? What is it? Destruction, exactly, you see. But you're absolutely right, you see. What happens, to what you become is far more important than what becomes of you. I mean, what could be worse than to be a wicked person? I mean, that's the worst thing that could happen to you. I mean, say he's a wicked person, but he, he, uh, he broke his arm. He's a good man, but he broke his arm. And the other man, he's, he's a wicked person, uh, but he has 20-20 eyesight, very good eyesight. <laughs> what advantage do you have if you're, if you're bad? And what disadvantage, well, Socrates used to like to say this, and what disadvantage if you're good, as far as that goes? Nothing can befall a person that's really bad if he's, if he's righteous and so on. But theme destruction, it's mentioned. Would you guess, Sister Wilson? This is a guess, and you better guess right, too. Is Sister Wilson here? You. Sister Wilson shrewdly decided to stay away and not be put to this one. Uh, well, Brother Warren. Brother, War I ask, Brother Warren, uh, would you make a guess as to how many times the word destruction or destroy appear in the Book of Mormon? These are useful questions. No, it is. It has a point. At least 100. At least 100, yes. Well, 534 times. It's just, it just sanded with destruction. How does it begin, uh, Brother Warren? How does the Book of Mormon begin with the, what, what's happening as the, as the curtain goes up? Where, where, where does it take place? Where, what is the scene laid in Fair Verona where we lay our scene? It's, speaking of like verse 25. Yes, right at the beginning of the Book of Mormon. Where does it begin? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is seething and just about ready to explode. And, Lehi gets out just in time, doesn't he? And where, when I ask Brother Warner this time, Brother Warner, what's happening when the curtain goes down? Everybody just got a story. It's some scene. It's like the last act of Hamlet, isn't it? The stage is sanded with bodies. Utter calamity and destruction. The Lamanites are no better off than the Nephites. The Nephites have been wiped out. The Lamanites are going into a long, long period of wiping each other out. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Well, then why so negative? We would always be cheerful, uh, as uh, Brother Valpogo should tell us, with a name like that. Weisheit, Rana, Dranzang, Gavell, and so forth. Remember, Sieg, first act of Siegfried is the Waldfogel that sings in its cheerfulness itself. It's springtime, of course. So that's, that's a good name. But uh, we'd like to be always cheerful, wouldn't we? But uh, do you conclude in general that uh, life is not the happiest thing in the world? When you balance the books, how does it come out? Does everybody have a happy life? If so, why do we have this rich literature in books on how to have a happy life? Everybody has his formula, and it turns out that he's an alcoholic or something. The guy that wrote the book almost invariably happens. But remember, what does it say in the Ode to the, to the Skylark? Brother Walt Fogel, that you should know, being a Skylark. Uh, yes, we look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell the saddest thought. Boo-hoo, because we can't get out of it. And there are others, of course. Uh, remember, you think you're enjoying yourself as long as you're drunk, as A.E. Hausman says. Remember his famous poem from the Shropshire Lab? But men at times are sober. They think by fits and starts, and when they think, they fasten their hands upon their hearts, absolutely scared stiff, you see. 
man who is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Do you want to know any work that is absolutely cheerful, that tells us that life is great and happy and all this sort of thing? I even forgot. Oh, it was Robert Browning who wrote that, wasn't it? Uh, you're th I'm thinking of what? Uh, Sister Waddell? Sister Waddell here? Yes. The the years of the spring, the days at the morn, mornings at seven, the hillsides do pearl, the lark's on the wing, the snail's on the thorn, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Nothing to discourage our little Pippa, can he? Remember that poem, Pippa Passes? Yes, you remember the poem now. <laughs> she, she, uh, she is the original, uh, she is the original Pollyanna, isn't she? Whatever happens to Pollyanna is great, you see. But, uh, Pippa, but what was actually Pippa's situation? She worked in a factory at the age of eight or nine, and she had to grind away 10 or 12 hours a day. And she had one day off a year, and that's the year when she sang this song, and everything's right with the world. It's, life is great, you know, and she really believed it. Of course, it's in your heart that you enjoy things. But you would, uh, do you envy the fate of our, our happy Pippa? Could you be happy under such a, maybe you could for one day. But then the day's over and she'll have a happy time anticipating next year when she'll have her one day off a year. That's no exaggeration, that one day off a year. Isn't it? See, that's the way they used to do in Scotland. You'd have one day off a year. That, means, that went for Sundays too. So you see, it's a pretty sad show. Well now, uh, is the purpose of the gospel, uh, that was good, you got Pippa right, so that's fine. Uh, now, uh, Brother uh, Van Verken, yeah. Van Verken, uh, here's a good one. Where we go on here? Uh, is it the purpose of the gospel to guarantee us a happy life? Well, the happiness of knowing that whatever cross we go through. Right that, that's where what happiness it, it really can do it, no matter how you suffer and so forth. You, you've read the, the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn, he's being repatriated in Russia, they tell me now. But what could be worse than the Gulag Archipelago? Yet the point of that is that they were free there. Nobody can make you sin, make you do the wrong thing, make you be evil, it can't be done, however they try. So of all things, the theme of the good like archipelago is freedom. And so we have here in the gospel, people write books, but what they're thinking of is how to happy life. The gospel would teach you to be a happy and successful life. And it lays down the principles of family and all this sort of thing. Uh, what kind of a life is the gospel preparing us for? Not the, yes, not the happy life, uh, Brother Van Verken. Um, what kind of life, what's the life we talk about that the, the gospel can give us? What, what life do we really want? Yes, that's why. Well, you say, isn't a happy life here adequate? Well, here you have a 22 situation, don't you? Uh, which, is the, which person is more likely to regret the shortness of life? And our sweetest songs are those that tell the saddest thought and so forth. Uh, as the Quran says, Adunya Khasara. This world is all lost. Everything is lost, and literally everything is passing away here all the time, isn't it? We're all oxidizing. As I say, gravitation is pulling us down. Look, it's sagging me at every point now. So <laughs> nothing I can do. What, why worry about it? That's not the life we're thinking about. Uh, but this, uh, this uh, life is a sad one and so forth. But here we are. Uh, we say an eternal life, which will assure us that we're happy here. But we want our eternal life to be a happy one. But eternal life could be a miserable one. That would be pretty bad, wouldn't it? We want to make sure that it's a happy one. But are we really going to have it? Is there really such a thing? That's what this, this was part of the Book of Mormon comes from. This comes closer to the gospel, see, from now on than anything else. Because the Lord comes actually down personally, and he talks to them and they visit them. Now they're on a chatty first person a level with, with the Lord himself. And he tells us that those things are real. Well, we have cause for believing they are so. But it's not imagination that. Uh, but eternal life, do we have the qualities to sustain it? A couple of years ago, the question I asked for that final essay, we come the last two weeks, well, you write an essay, uh, was uh, if you were guaranteed uh, all your comforts in life, you, you received a, for, the, for a thousand years. You're going to be allowed a thousand years funded for everything you need and so forth, what would you do? How would you spend your thousand years? And you wouldn't know they were all at a loss. Nobody had a good reason why you should live a thousand years. Well, you want to live an eternity if it's not going to last forever. Do you, do you recall, uh, well, I'll skip to Brother 
Underwood now, is Brother Underwood here? Yeah, Brother Underwood, uh, a favorite, not a favorite theme, a theme you find in, uh, in science fiction writer, is the people that can't die, the old ones and so forth. Have you ever read much of Heinlein, Robert Heinlein? Very interesting because in his, uh, he's sort of a fascist, but he's a vivid science fiction writer, and he always gets the Mormons in somewhere. In his, uh, no, that's what the science fiction writer calls Mormonizing. Also, Scott Card, Orson Scott Card, who wins the prize, you know, Latter-day Saints writes some very good science fiction. He wins all the prizes and so forth. He's a distant relative and he's a very close friend. And uh, they talk about it now, the science fiction writer, talking about Mormonizing. What would you mean by, this is relevant to what we're talking about here. We have the idea of terminal eternal life, and we talk about it as an abstraction and so forth. Now here the Book of Mormon takes us right onto the scene. We step right into the picture of the eternities and start talking and chatting and eating together with people from the other side. That's what you would call Mormonizing. It's giving an element of plausibility to things that happen. See, what is possible, you see? See, today we have a background, a space travel and this sort of thing, and we can think of such things because it's in those literal terms we have in the Book of Enoch and so forth, in the, in the, uh, in the passage of time, in the process of time, Enoch was taken away and they'll come back and so forth. Well, I, I suppose you'd call this uh, uh, Mormonizing science fiction. But uh, the greatest... But, well, I just cited the, the Crown Red says, Adunya Kassara. The world really is life now. We say everything is oxidizing, passing away, being dragged down, and so forth. Uh, is Sister Tremel, or Tremel, a, uh, the girls are wise, they stay away. Uh, oh, is Sister Tremel here? Oh, is Sister Towery? Towery who? Oh, it's Mark Tower, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes. Brother Tower, yes. Now, the, uh, here, what is promising to be the greatest problem we have? What is the one thing our civilization is producing in unique quantities that nothing else ever has? I've lived in, in civilization where they were having a hard time in Greece and at very bad times in Greece and in, and in Germany and so forth, in the Black Forest and so forth. I never heard of them wasting anything. The concept of a a uh, garbage dump would have been blasphemous. But what is the main product we produce today in our world? The end product is garbage, and that's a serious thing. It is the unsolved problem. That would include nuclear garbage, too. But it's the unsolved problem. It's a horrible thing. We're going we're gonna to wallow in it. We're going to be suffocated in it. And the one thing we leave, our majestic ruins would be a few hideous reinforced concrete foundations and things like that. Even the ruins we leave will be hideous. So the ancients left some ruins that were pretty handsome, you know. But, but for ours, Egypt and Greece and so forth, but for us to have nothing but garbage, that's the greatest problem in the world today, waste disposal. You know, of the six largest, highest paid executives in the world, two of them are in the business of waste disposal. That's what you get paid for today. If you can handle that stuff, and how do they do it? They put it on barges, and what do they do with it when it goes on barges? Well, <laughs> I'm going to ask you something, Brother Tari. Uh, have you any good ideas for disposing of this junk? Yes. How? Is that a good idea? Not a good idea. It is not a good idea, as Brother Cousteau tells us, doesn't he? Find... <laughs> well, when years ago, when uh, in the when uh, what's his name, the Norwegian, uh, made his trip in the it wasn't in the Ray, it's the one the the Contiki, yes, in, in the Contiki. Hor, uh, Thor Heyerdahl made his trip in the uh, in the Contiki. I had a long talk with Thor Heyerdahl once, many months, and uh, in the middle of the Pacific, of the South Pacific, going over a million miles from nowhere, you know, the garbage floating by, in disposable. Uh, things turned out, the, the sort of thing that Brother Huntsman turns out today, indestructible, non-cyclable and so forth. They're, they're mounting all the time. They're cheap, they're convenient, and so we just go on making them. And we're smothering them, but the ocean is full of Because they were in a raft, you see, they were down right at the level. On a big ship you miss a lot of that, you see, but when you're right down floating in the stuff, you realize it's gunk clear across the ocean. And then what these tankers are spilling and everything else, they, they don't be able, seem to be unable to contain themselves. <laughs> they have to put diapers on all tankers now, I suppose. <laughs> they can't control themselves like so many babies. Eh? <laughs> the, uh, so, the, so that's it, you see. So our epitaph would be this. I would say this. The one would be, 
and they couldn't leave anything alone. So we can't do it. And the other is they made to our good. You see, the, the good, the best thing they can say about our age is they made a lot of money. So we do that, and that's what we make. You see, the money's on paper. It isn't even on paper anymore. It's in a computer now. A blip, and you've lost your fortune. <laughs> well, this happened to me, not in money, of course, but I lost two weeks' work the last semester when the gal hit a wrong key on the computer and wiped everything out. So we can do that, you see. What a, what a passing, temporary, flimsy, brittle society we have. Now, Nephi 9 and 2, 3rd Nephi 9 and 2, describe, the Lord describes the situation. Things have hit bottom here in Nephi 9 and 2. This is what it is. Well, now, first about this voice. Remember, this voice that's heard. Uh, President Grant used to tell a story about that. A friend of his who mocked the Book of Mormon, he says, that's, that's the fatal weakness of the Book of Mormon, hearing a voice that wasn't a loud voice, yet people could hear it for 50, 60 miles away. That's absurd. To be heard, a voice has to be so loud. So many decibels, of course. Then, then radio come al came along, and uh, Brother Grant had an answer to that. A voice heard among all the inhabitants of the earth, Pompeii, the, the whole land. Now, this isn't the soft, gentle voice that's going to follow. But you'll notice an interesting thing here in this chapter. These verses 2 to, to 13, to, uh, yes, 2 through 12, and 13 to 22, exactly 10 verses each. That's a striking thing, and quite a coincidence, isn't it? 10 verses showing the Lord's severity, and the next 10 showing his real nature. That how men brought this on themselves and so forth. Notice it's, it divides right in the middle here. He starts out with, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, he announces himself as what we would call a, an aratology. An aratology is where, well, that's from ancient uh, literature and so forth, where God announces his own activities and purposes and so forth in his own glory. See, when men praise God, what do they call it? Uh, can anybody tell us that? Uh, Brother Tom... Hey, we got down to Thompson last time, didn't we? So let's start at the top now. We very clever we are this way. Cover everything. So, Brother Aldridge. Yes. Now the uh, we talk we're talking about an aratology here, and I was going to ask you something, and and uh, heard on the face of the land. Well, we'll get to it. He's too far. No. So verses three to twelve, you notice, are one theme, and verses. 13 to 22, the, half, the other half, just like the first chapter of the Doctrine and Covenants, remember, is divided exactly in the middle. 18 verses, woe upon the earth, then the next 18 verses, the glory that's going to come, and the promises and how to gate it and what you can do about it. You don't have to suffer. It's not necessary to go through all this and so forth. And that's what we have here. Now notice here, the Lord personally takes responsibility for the great destruction that's been wrought. This sounds like the savage, vengeful, old tribal god of the Old Testament they talk about in, in seminaries and in, in uh, both Protestant and Catholic schools and so forth. The god of the Old Testament, the savage tribal god. Where he wasn't savage and tribal at all. The law is it summed up in, in Deuteronomy, the whole law that the German, that they, that they had to lo uh, learn by heart. Uh, is far more humane and gentle than our laws it's marvelous law. It's, we won't go into that now, but it, it is really something. Taking care of everybody, no cruelty, it's, it's a marvelous thing. We rule that out. We don't, we don't bother to read the thing. But here he takes personal responsibility. But he tells us first, well, the second part, he tells us how he feels about it and see what kind of a god he is. Oh, what's wrong with the critics here? They call him a savage old tribal god then. Well, from their point of view, he is. Because if you did that sort of thing, uh, Brother Aldridge, you would say that you were a savage and tribal person. If you went in, somebody wronged you, or did wrong, or disobeyed, and you went in and slash banged and destroyed them, just wiped them out, women and children, one and all, you would be considered playing pretty rough, wouldn't you? You would be a savage person. It's not enough to say that God's men aren't, aren't man's ways. The lesson of the Book of Mormon is, man shall not judge, neither shall he smite. Remember, that's summed up in Mormon 8 and 20. But God does it. God judges. He is the judge. But don't you judge, judge not, we're told again and again. See, God does things that men don't do. He lives on a different level entirely. He sees the whole thing. It's a different thing entirely with him. It's not the way it is with us because of our limited view of things. 
You're going to see more of that a little later on. It's very striking. But we don't... Now, for example, uh, you might call this a surgical strike. Things had got so bad there was nothing else to do. They had to, they, they had to excise all the, all the cancer, all the infection in the, in the body here. And uh, the... Uh, well, the... Uh, and so men try surgical strikes. Oh, no. That's not right for them. Because they don't know the situation. It's a very dangerous thing to do. You don't try a surgical strike. You don't hit... Uh, to anticipate a person might strike you, so you make the first move and so forth. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's become with us a military action justification. We shoot because they might shoot. Of course, though we're told that, again, this is very clear, very clear as the Lord says, that you, you cannot punish a person for the good he, for the evil he might do. See, the Lord has been asked again and again by Abraham, he was asked uh, by the apostles at Capernaum, why don't you punish these wicked people? They're beyond salvation. The Lord said, no, I'm not going to punish them. Let them go their way. I, I, that's what I don't do. They have their free agency here as far as that goes. He says, when the judgment comes, then they will be judged. But meantime, Capernaum can go on. Capernaum can go on uh, doing what it does. And when the Lord tells us uh, to keep hands off, but we don't. Uh, you cannot punish a person for a crime he hasn't committed. Yet, no matter how probable it may be that he will commit it, you can't do it. Of course, that's, and of course that's forbidden in the Constitution. But we, we do practice these things today. Well, now I'll get around it now, Brother Aldrich. What I would talk about extermination the last time. This was not a major extermination, was it? There was lots left. There was ma one major extermination or in the scriptures which really wiped things out. A worldwide catastrophe. And what was that? And the flood, exactly, the flood. Now, exactly the same situation here. That has been the main reason, you see, why God, why men have, have uh, criticized God. He, uh, I wrote a, an article, I could have written along, on the theodicy, the justification of God. Not just uh, in modern times, not just, uh, not just uh, people like H.L. Mencken and uh, the professional uh, atheists, to do that, but uh, they bring the flood against God as, the, pro uh, as the, the strongest proof against God. A good God would not send the flood. See, it flooded women, children, and everybody, and so forth. But of course, again, we have the revelation to tell us, make that very clear, which is exactly the way it's going to be made clear here, and that is when we find at the right at the end of the book of Moses. And this follows Genesis here, and then he goes on and gives us more, though. And at the end of Moses, the last two verses are those we find in, in uh, it ends up this way, where it has to end. Same as Genesis 6, 11 and 12 is Moses. It's not the same, but same. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. When corruption starts, it can go all, it can go all the way. You can get such a thing as total corruption. The world has seen it before. And uh, you get total something, and then you had it. So what happens then? God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Everybody's being... Notice, who's being violent? Who is destroying things here? See, men are doing... We've got to stop them. You see, that's all that can happen. The earth had to be purged by the flood and so forth. They weren't going to... They had no intention. They'd made it clear they had no intention to reform. And behold, I will destroy all flesh from off the earth. So we have here... A little further back in Moses, well, I think 727 to 37. Oh, here it is, right here. Boy, I'm getting so rattled because I'm writing on one thing and talking about another. Uh, here you have it. How the Lord feels about the flood. So Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and fell on many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. So they're caught up. He kicks the good people of time. And there's a shuttle service here. And this is, there are other accounts of this same thing. The angels descend and ascend. They come down and bring people away. As they can bring them, as the angels bring people out of Sodom and Gomorrah, as they came and rescued Lot and his family. Remember, they said, get out of this town. It's going to be destroyed. Lot wanted to stay. He said, you can't stay. You've got to come. And you, his wife wanted to wait. You can't wait. You've got to go right now. And so the angel actually grabbed them and dragged them out, and dragged them outside the city. Uh, the angels descended out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, fellow many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven to Zion. 
And it came to pass that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, they were the wicked, that weren't gathered to Zion. And whether you got gathered to Zion or not was entirely your own decision, as it tells us earlier. They were missionaries. They say it was a crash program to preach to the people. So this is what happens when they, the residue of the people, God looked upon them and wept. This is how he felt about it, you see. And he not bore record of it in saying, how is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as rain upon the mountains? Notice the preparations for the flood here. It's already starting to rain. And, and the dramatic, make, the whole book of, of Moses, you see, is archaic. This is a very old thing. This is your Enoch stuff. And it has this marvelous nature prose in it. They mix the two together. You'll see that there's more to that than you think here. And uh, uh, heavens weep and shed forth their tears as rain upon the mountains. And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy? Now God is weeping about it. He's not at all happy about this. That thou art holy and from all eternity to all eternity. We're supposed to live that we might have joy if God himself has to cry. There's something wrong here, <laughs> something seriously wrong. And were it possible that man could number the earth, yea, millions of earths like this, it could not begin to number, but it would not be the beginning to the number of thy creations. Now, wait a minute. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Millions of earths like this, like this, notice, like this. Other. Same material, same mess, but one thing that the scientists tell us today, and also whatever one thing is made of, they're all made of, and like this. And that's just the beginning of his creations. Well, my land, this reason why the last person in the world to be upset. And thy curtains are stretched out still. That means the creation is going on still. There's a lot said about the curtains. They put curtains between the galaxies, you see. They will not uh, associate with here. They call that uh, space. What do they call it? The scientists have a word for that, anyway. Uh, like this, not be a beginning to the number of thy creations, and thy curtains are stretched out still. And yet thou art there, and thy bosom is there. Notice this idea of space. It's marvelous. Of course, this is the book of Moses here. This is exactly what, what uh, quantum physics is teaching us today, quantum mechanics. Thou art there, and thy bosom is there, and thou art just, and thou art merciful and kind forever. Thou hast taken Zion to thine own bosom from all creations and from all eternity to all eternities. I think this fusing of everything is here. And not but peace, peace, justice, and truth is the habitation of thy throne. And mercy shall go before thy face and have what magnificent prose that is, and have no end. How is it thou canst weep? This is the thing that has him absolutely stopped, you see. But the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, this is why he weeps. These thy brethren. We're going to learn here the intimate relationship that Christ has with the people. He's going to come and move with them and stay with them and visit them and talk with them. Get to know every one of them personally, become a personal friend with each one of them. It's quite a marvelous thing. We're going to see more of that. In a minute, hang on. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands, and I gave unto them knowledge, that's what they'd need, the day I created them. And in the Garden of Eden I gave them their agency. What more do you want? He made them free, gave them their agency, and they had the necessary knowledge, of course, but with knowledge and agency still, how would you blunder? How would you know which was the right way to go? He said, I gave them instructions, I gave them commandments too. And unto thy brethren I have said, and also given commandment, that they should love one another, and that they should choose me their father. Now he's, here is this whole universe in which everything is related with everything else. We've got to get along together. We're all in the same family. We don't start fighting or trying to take advantage of each other. That would louse everything up, wouldn't it? Absolutely. We must love one another if things are going to continue at all must love one another, and that they should choose me their father. But behold, they are without affection. They hate their own blood. Everybody and people hate each other. The fire of mine indignation is kindled, and in my hot... Now, here's the anger. See, here's what's happening. The fire of mine indignation is kindled, and in my hot displeasure I will send the floods upon them. My fierce anger is kindled against them. Notice the two images of fire and water are both here. The fire of my indignation is kindled against them. That's a fire. In my hot displeasure, no fire kindled hot, I will send the floods upon them. The other part of it, see, we've got a very volcanic world, floods and, well, of course, now we have the Atlantic rifts and all those things where the earth is formed by volcanic fires, by the heat of the earth escaping uh, through the oceans and cooling off and the floods stop it. You see. Well, anyway, in the floods upon them, for my fierce anger again is kindled against them. So it goes on. Well, you see how the Lord feels about this. It's not his his idea at all. So um, this being the flood, 
After the first part of chapter 9, that first part, no, notice this. I say this is a, sort of an narratology. It is a narratology. And he describes himself. Notice in every verse how uh, Brother Barrows now, uh, Brother Barrows here? All right, here. When he talks like this, behold, they've had this terrible affliction. He says, behold, I have burned with fire. Zarahemla, I have burned with fire. We saw the first thing that happens in an earthquake. <coughs> The great city of Moroni have I caused to be sunk into the depths of the sea. The great city of Moroni have I covered with earth <coughs> and the inhabitants thereof to hide their iniquities. Behold, the city of Gilgal have I caused to be sunk and the inhabitants thereof in the depths of the earth. Seventh verse, the waters have I caused to come up in the stead thereof and hide their wickedness and abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and the saints may not come up against any more against me, against them, except. Eighth verse, the city of Gim Gimno and all these have I, these other cities, have I caused to be sunk and made hills and valleys, and the inhabitants thereof have I buried up in the depths of the earth, to hide, of course, to hide their wickedness and abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and saints should not come any more unto me against them. Behold, the great city of Jacob of Gath, by the people of King Jacob, I have caused to be burned with fire. And so it goes. Now, and then we stop there, you see. Well, and then the tenth one, of course. Well, notice here, he gives an explanation here. What's the explanation immediately here in this, in this ninth verse? Would you find an explanation why he did this by the barrows? Notice in this, uh, in the verse here, where he says, uh, it, which was above all the wickedness of the whole earth. It had to be pretty bad to suffer that. And then he says, because. And you notice an interesting thing here that we haven't been pointing out. We've been pointing out all the eyes, but notice in every verse he says, I have caused. Now, notice here in this, uh, in this ninth verse where it says, because of their wickedness. And then he says, therefore, in the same verse, therefore I did cause them. Cause and because keep going all the time here. I caused it because they caused it, in other words. Because I caused them to be burned. And then the next one, Tenth verse, I caused them to be burned because of their wickedness. And the next one, I did send, as stoning those whom I did send to declare them, they've been, been making war on him, see? He says, and stoning those whom I did send to declare unto them concerning their abominations. And, eleventh verse, because they did cast them out, that there were none righteous among them, I did send down fire to destroy them. When he gives the cause, all right, this was... And who brought the cause on them as far as that goes? The because was there, as you see. Here's the action. Notice there are three, there are three agents acting here. We're going to get them pretty soon here. Uh, where it starts out here. What does it say here? The angel. The devil laughs as an angel rejoice. Oh, yes. It begins right at the second verse. We have three agents here. Notice in the second verse. And who are they? Uh, um, Brother Barrows, there are three parties acting. There are three members of the cast here acting. Three parties involved here. And who are they? And just, uh, just in this uh, short second verse. Well, there is the I there, the Lord. And there is this people. And who is the third, third actor? Who's the third actor here? Who's laughing and his angels rejoice? See, we have three characters. We have a, a triangle here to con consider. The devil laugheth and his angels rejoice. It's just the way he wants it, you see. But he didn't cause it. Remember, they did yield themselves, it said in the preceding chapter. They did yield themselves to the temptations. They gave up to him. He had no power over them otherwise. But now they'd given in. They, did, they played the game according to his rules, the way he wanted them to. So he laughs and his angels rejoice. And that's a very interesting thing. This verse is, is in the ancient Enoch. We find this. I mean, we have ancient texts of Enoch that go way back. And uh, this, this passage occurs in them too. And uh, the devils laugheth and his angels rejoice because of the slain of the fair sons. Because of their, there's your because, you see. He laughs because he sees the people being slaughtered, everything lost. And they're being slaughtered because of their iniquity that they are fallen, you see. It was their iniquity that did it. So we see the agents and the agencies here. There's God who's trying to do everything good, who gives them everything they want and so forth, and gives them the advice and gives them the instruction. And then there's the devil trying to trip them up. They don't have to yield if they don't want to. And uh, it's because of their iniquity that they are fallen. 
And today there's a serious trouble in the world, a good example of this very same thing, isn't it? What is the, this is a hard one, uh, is Brother Bentil here? Bentil? Uh, oh yes, I know. Uh, yes, it was here. I don't know whether he dropped out or not. Uh, well, Sister Bergeson here? Yes. Uh, Sister Bergeson, today, we have such a problem today, it's, uh, it's a uh, paradoxical sort of thing. Uh, what is that particular plague that's worrying people that may fill the earth in a short time, uh, which is distinguished by the fact that people practically force it on themselves? You don't have to get it unless you want it, almost to speak. And people knowing about it are willing to take the risk. So who have you to blame for this terrible plague? Everybody's going around trying to find a cure for it and say this is an awful thing and this should never happen and so forth. It should never happen, of course. But uh, uh, Sister Bergeson, uh, what, are you, what am I talking about? AIDS. Of course I'm talking about AIDS. You see, this is the way it is, you see. Now, who's to blame for that, you see? Well, men didn't create it. They didn't make it. Did the devil make it? He doesn't make anything. He can't create anything, not even AIDS. That's a, over. Remember, he can neither beget nor can he create, and that's one of the sad things about him. All he can do is tear down. See, all his work is negative. Well, he has to react. He has to wait till God acts, and then he reacts. He has to wait till you act, then he reacts, you see. The people that do that, that for a long time, that was our policy in various... We had to wait till the Russians did something, then we'd do something. But uh, the... Uh, this is a thing, you see, who would you say was responsible for it? If it goes any farther, it goes bad, they'll say, oh God, why have you allowed this to happen to us? And they do that. They, these people feel very sad, they feel put upon, uh, they go right along with their practices and they, and they feel it's not, this life just isn't being fair to them, that's all. They're pitiful characters, you know, they're always rather sentimental and so on. But uh, oh, that's a real tragedy. So this is the situation we're up against here. The, uh, but after this, now, after this, uh, uh, Brother Bowen here? Yes, Brother Bowen. Is it Bowen or Bowen? Bowen. Yes. Puzzle Bo Bowen used to call it Bowen, but everybody else had called it Bowen, so he yielded to it. Uh, Brother Bowen, now, the, uh, we've had this, these first uh, 15 verses, uh, 10 verses, these 10. After these 10 verses, when God said, I, 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 he takes, the, he takes responsibility for the whole thing. Uh, then when he personally appears on the scene, if you were writing a play, what would you expect to come on? You know Peer Gynt, don't you? The Peer Gynt Suite. You know Grieg's, the great Peer Gynt. It's a great play by Ibsen, you know, Peer Gynt. Well, Peer Gynt wanders all over the earth, but uh, his uh, final score is with the boy, this monster voice that comes out and representing it's a come thing that can only come out of the edges. It's a sort of Nordic horror. But you hear this great booming voice, or like the voice of God coming from heaven in the Ten Commandments, in the movie The Ten Commandments. When you hear that sort of thing, the way he's talking here, this terrifying voice, what side of a person would you expect to come walking on the stage, Brother Moore? After you heard that, you prepare, here he comes, he's coming, and you expect some sort of monster, <laughs> some horror like Godzilla to come out after a description like this, isn't it? Well, if you're, if you're going to interpret it that way, you say, here is your cruel, savage old god, so you expect him to come blustering on like the villain in a, in a Japanese no player in a Chinese tragedy or something like Swagger, something quite terrifying. But he isn't terrifying at all when he comes, is he? In, in what form does he come? How does he appear to the Nephites when he appears in the next chapter? Well, this is the, uh, the, well, this is the good one. The Lord came and mingled with the people, didn't he, on intimate terms. This is what happens. Let's turn to Nephi, 3rd Nephi 11 now, and uh, he appears to them eight, you see. Talk about the voice, first of all. They were gathered down the temple. Well, it's only fair to read the second, to read the second half of that chapter. I guess we'd better do that first. Let's, let's go back to chapter 9 here. And this is his case. There's the case, you might say, this is the case against him. Here's your savage God destroying all these people. Because of their wickedness. And then he starts out, just as he talked to Enoch, notice in the 13th verse. <coughs> oh, ye that are spared, because ye are more righteous than they, will you not now turn to me and repent and be converted? And now he starts the eyes again. He starts saying, I notice, that I may heal you. And the next one, verily I say unto you, if you'll come unto me, you shall have eternal life. Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended. All the time, so you have this standing offer, and if you refuse it and continue to go on and know what you're doing, what can you expect? 
My arm of mercy is extended, and whosoever will come, I will, will I receive. See, here's the eyes again. Then we go down verse 15. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I created the heavens and the earth. Now see this, again, we're going to a, another dimension. We have no business judging here at all. You see what's happened. It was a thing, and all things that in them are. I was with the Father from the beginning. I am in the Father, and the Father in me. And in me hath the Father glorified his name. Now here we get the same, it's not a mystery at all. It's made very clear by John from the 14th through the 17th chapter of John. This is, he talks about this all the time and makes it very clear what he's talking about. And the Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi, makes it even clearer what we're dealing with here, the nature of the Father and the Son, and course. But here he is, he's one with the Father. Now he wants to be one with us. He wants to be personal friends with us and put him not on his level, but in the same universe of discourse with him. He's going to be not only a friend and brother, he's going to come down as intimately as you please, just as he did in his first mission in a little while here. I am the Father, and the Father in me. I came to my own, and my own received him not, the 16th verse, and the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled. And as many as have received to them, I have given to become sons of God. See, the members of the family, what more could you possibly want than that? Here, here's a new order. Uh, it's opening the doors on, on eternity here. This is another thing entirely. Well, it's worth the price, isn't it? And they brush that off. He gives them this offer. You, they have to make a, a determined effort to refuse it, to turn it down. I have to become the sons of God, and even so will I, to as many as shall believe on my name. It's still wide open. For behold, in me redemption cometh, and in me the law of Moses is fulfilled. Uh, from this point on, uh, we are ready to go on then. The point of Moses, the law of Moses is fulfilled, but it is not abrogated. We're going to add to it now. Just as the word of wisdom is fulfilled, if you observe it, if you don't even have to think of it. If you go into the next world, we won't have to be reminded constantly hereafter not to be smoking cigars or, or drinking strong liquor or anything like that, because we won't even think of it. The law is fulfilled, so to speak. That is not the basic law for us anymore. It wasn't even in the Doctrine and Covenants. Well, so then here we have it. I am the light and life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, I was going to bring along something there. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, because the earliest Christian and Jewish writings we have, instead of Alpha and Omega, they used Alpha and Tau, the last letter of the old Greek alphabet, as well as of the old Hebrew and Aramaic alphabets, well, all of the also, it's T or Tau, it's the cross. It begins with the cross. And alpha is Aleph, of course, the same thing in, in Hebrew as it is in Greek. It's Aleph, Aleph, the beginning, uh, the meaning, the, the getting together, summing all things in one already at the beginning, the, the beginning and the end. And they're described in the earliest uh, Syriac writings as Alpha and Omega, the life and the light. They use that, uh, the, the light and the life of the world. The Alpha stands for the light that dawns, and the Omega or the Tau stands for the life of the world, which is the redemption, which is the cross that comes at the end. But this is used not only, see, by Greeks, Alpha and Omega, Greek terms, you expect, well, this is something. But of course, it is translated into English. We know what that means because it's traditional. In our language, you use it, and that's what it's supposed to convey to us, that he's the beginning and the end, and it sums it all up. Now, the Alpha is the Kaf, and the Alpha is the Kaf, that's the famous Kabbalist Maragdina. Won't go into that now. But that's the O that sums everything up. Omega is the big O. That's the big circle. That, according to the Pythagoreans, shows that all things may be encompassed in a single, uh, may it, maybe, uh, all truth may be encompassed in a single round. That's the omega. So that's the end, alpha and omega. But the thing is, this usage, beginning and end, alpha and omega, A and T and so forth, was very common anciently, and it belonged to the to the mysteries, it's archaic and begins with the idea that the, that the light breaks and the redemption is completed with the end, the, the light and the life. This is what he's talking about here. And ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Now he goes into the law of Moses immediately, see? Ye shall offer a sacrifice, a broken heart, and a contrite spirit. Then he says here, notice, and if you do that, I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Then, the 21st verse, behold, I have come unto the world to bring redemption. That's the idea. Redemption means buying you back again. You've made all these blunders, you've made all these mistakes. To pay it off and buy you back again is what I've come for, because if you're let go, if you continue on the course which you are now on, you of course are lost. You can't, you can't bring yourself back again. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It can't be done. We just get deeper and deeper all the time. Interesting stories and poems about that in our follies. And it is so, we don't get better. And therefore, 
Whoso repenteth, so what you have to do is start at the beginning. And throughout the Savior's mission here, he, spend, he pays a special attention to the children. The children, we must be as little children. He insists on that, and he really means it here. And so he starts right out with it here. This is the thing that so impressed uh, uh, Stendhal, Christopher Stendhal, the great uh, Lutheran divine I mentioned the last time. This, and he gave a talk in, in the assembly here on this very subject, the third Nephi and the little children. So very important. Uh, we've got to have, being redeemed, you have to have a new start because you have to enter into it. You have to do your part. All right, I'll shut all that old up. I'll begin, I'll listen to it. I'll do it your way, in other words. I'll submit completely your instruction and do what you tell me to do. That's what he wants us to do. You must come to me as a little child, him will I receive. For such are the kingdom of God. Behold, for such I have laid down my life. So most emphasis on this in, in what follows. Uh, to be the little child is to be completely honest. In the following, you see, uh, without prejudice, you may be free of knowledge or anything else, but you're, you're also willing to take, you're, you're uh, full of wonder, you see. There's a thing that Einstein said and other people are always saying. That almost all great physicists have made that remark. We must be as little children if we're going to do or learn anything at all. Remember Newton's famous remark, uh, uh, Brother Burdett, is Brother Burdett here? Now we'll think about this one, uh, uh, Brother Buss. Brother Buss, the famous remark of Newton, that he compares himself, you see he was the greatest scientist of his time, he gave us the Newtonian system, he actually made the biggest, well he wasn't, he was one of the biggest forward steps ever made, we thought it was the biggest until others came along. But uh, with all he gave us, uh, he, Isaac Newton says, he is like a little child on the seashore picking up shells while the vast ocean of knowledge lies before him unexplored, you see. Uh, is he re did, he re did he think of that just as a metaphor, the fact that there was so much more to learn than he knew? It has more than that. It's not just the knowledge he was lacking, but what does it imply as to his own state of mind, as to his own condition? When he recognizes that he's a little child, what does he mean by that? That there's a lot he has to learn, but what is the attitude of the child? Is what I'm asking. Anybody, the, the most arrogant, uh, conceited scientist or pseudoscientist in the world will admit that there's an awful lot he has to learn. You see, that we're not perfect. Some people think they've made a great concession when they say we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. You haven't made any concession at all. But it's not that, is it? But the state of mind that Newton had. Do you know anything about Newton? Uh, a marvelous study was written by, by John Maynard Keynes. You economy students must read Keynes, so uh, the, uh, you read Keynes' Life of Newton. He wrote a, a biography of Newton. And Keynes, that's, that's a marvelous thing on that. But his naivety, his freshness, he was like a little child. He actually was. And the same thing with, uh, with Einstein. He was absolutely naive in the questions he asked. Every, he would start people laughing. He would ask such simple, childish questions, and that's the questions that people never answered. They were too proud. They thought those things were settled and so forth. Notice this business like a little child is, is no joke. The great ones were all like little children. We're all very naive. Remember, Solon was the wisest of the Greeks. And when he visited Egypt, the priest of Heliopolis said to him, the priest there said, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are always like children. <laughs> uh, the Egyptians had the age-old knowledge and so forth. And Solon was, he acquired the same. He studied in, in Egypt, that was where it was. But he carried it on, you see, to other things. Greek science is a projection. But nevertheless, this childishness is no joke here. So we have to come as little children. And uh, so now we'll, uh, oh, I should, maybe I suggest people want something to do. Maybe I could suggest some questions we should ask ourselves about uh, the next one. The, uh, what could we ask here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this question, I'll be asking people a uh, question. How would you solve this question here? The, uh, the catastrophes hit just at the time these people were at their wickedness. They both hit bottom. Now, was that a coincidence or was it not a coincidence? To what degree does, were these things controlled? Were they adjusted so that it would hit them just right? Or were the people led just so they would meet it? See, we have these two paths and they cross here. We get something like a uh, sort of relativity study here. But uh, how, is this, how is it arranged? And is the same thing happening in our way? Are we, we are on a collision course. Uh, therefore, it can be prophesied. But when prophesied, must it happen and so forth? This is a very basic problem in modern science, as you may know, whether these things can be prophesied, whether they must necessarily take place or not. We may talk about uh, that 
more the next time. That's the kind of a question. And uh, the uh, was it a coincidence? Then why did the Lord say I did it? He keeps saying I did it. Well, all this stuff. Did he deliberately start the, cracking up the earth? Did he still press a button and start those volcanoes erupting? Did he hold them back until that time? How did he do it? Of course, you don't know how he did it. But was it a coincidence? There's uh, more than you think to the question.